Um, it's good to be here this morning. Um, it's kind of different what I'm going to be doing this morning. Uh, so just follow with me. Um, I'm going to try my best to move as slow as I can through this. I know y'all are ready to get out, but God has a word for us this morning. Uh, with that being said, if I go too fast for you this morning, I've done something different. Uh, every one of the slides that you'll see, there's a paper in the back with every one of those listed. So if you miss something, just grab one of those in the back. It has all my points, my emphases, and uh, the verses. So with that being said, I went way back for this message, and, and I believe God's timing is always perfect. Um, in fact, I told Ross last week when I realized that I had to preach today, I was just like, oh, crap, I forgot. i got to preach the, uh, next Sunday. Um, but I already had in my mind what I wanted to do. Sometimes God gives you a word for a time, and then sometimes he gives you a word for a later time. Um, we have to be able to discern what that is. Um, and it's crazy. Uh, when I told him I knew what I wanted to do, um, I remember pinning it down in my notebook. And so I ran back there, and I was like, I'm just curious how old this message is. Um, no, I'm not, first and foremost, I'm not running out of things. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's just some things I know are not meant for the season especially even maybe in a season I'm in, that I may not be ready to present it in the way that God has fashioned it to be for his people. So I went back in, and it was three years almost to the exact day that I prepared it. Just on March 23rd, two more days, it had been three years to the exact day. Maybe it's God, maybe that's super spiritual. However you want to take it, I believe that it's a word for us this morning. Aside from those cool pieces of information, I've learned a lot in the last few years um, I decided to go full-time, and then the COVID pandemic decided to happen. So um, not only was it trial by fire, but I had no idea what was going to happen next. Everything I thought about ministry had changed. People have changed. People have come and go, places and things. All things that have changed have caused me to rethink and repurpose not the thought or the truth, but to refit it to make it be where we are today. I believe that the beautiful thing is that we can look back on things that are written. Um, we can look, we do it all the time when we read the Bible. None of that was written to this day. We don't have volume one, volume two, and volume three. It's timeless truths. The beautiful thing about the Bible is it's timeless no matter where we are, where you are in your walk. And when we bring back truths from the Bible, when we bring truths from everyday life, it is still a timeless truth, a truth to which that we can hold on to. And I know as a pastor, I've learned a lot, and I learned that we have to have fresh words. So in a sense, this is fresh. I've never done it before. I've always had it in the back of my mind, but something was always for a different time. I, I could have preached it 5,000 times by now to the LPYA, or I could have chosen to do it here the last couple of times. But I still see God's divine hand and say, and this was for this time, this was for this time, and this was for this time. So even in the small thing is just this. And I know it's our quote-unquote job and duty uh, to have fresh things, and I get that. But when I pinned this thing down and, and, it re, and I revisited it after I was doing the same exact task, it was a refreshing for me too. Because I looked at where I was and where I am now and I realized that I am just as much guilty as a lot of the things that I'm preaching about this morning. So you have to check yourself sometimes, before, well not sometimes, the Bible says look for the own speck in your eye before you look, or the own plank in your eye before you look at the speck of the sawdust in somebody else's. So I had to re-examine myself. I had to look at where I was and where I am. But I understand just because I received it then, it doesn't mean that was for that moment. And all that to say God's timing is absolutely 100% perfect, even when we don't understand it. And if there was ever a time that we needed a message about maintaining one's life, I believe it's now. About maintaining the life. So the life of a Christian. So today we're going to dive into a message called the weeds of life. The weeds of life. And with this today, this is going to be about maintaining your life, your walk with Christ. Now understand a lot of the times in the Greek language when they have translated it into what we know today as the Bible, we understand that walk in Greek really didn't mean one foot in front of the other. When they were pinning this, they literally meant your walk of life, how you live, each thing that you do, not so much the steps you take, but the actions within the everyday. That's the walk with Christ. It's the things that we do or we don't do. Walk with Christ by examining your garden, so to speak, which will be a metaphor for your life this morning. When I use garden or a flower bed, it's a metaphor for life. And when I say weeds, it's going to be a metaphor for sin. With that being said, by looking and taking stock of what we're allowing to grow in our lives, 
what we're allowing to grow in our gardens, what we're allowing to be there, and not even what we're allowing to be there so much as what we're fertilizing, what we're allowing to grow by giving it life when we should, really should be plucking it up and killing it. Well, and, and that's the whole question. What are you feeding this morning? What is it that you're feeding in your life that is no good for you whatsoever? What are you feeding? What are you fertilizing? By a show of hands in here, I know if I ask this question, some of you may not raise it, but I know if I ask another one, you probably will. How hard do you know it is for those of you that have flower beds or gardens, how aggravating and hard it can be to maintain it? Okay, how many of you stopped having a flower bed simply because you hated maintaining it? See, I knew too. So it, it's, it's, it's terrible. I absolutely despise it. But we got to have something that looks nice. You always have to stay on top of the weeds. If not, those jokers will pop up overnight. Sometimes it feels like they pop up once you turn around. They're already there again. I mean, I'm, I'm forever in a day, feels like, weeding our two flower beds. And one of them is not that big, but it has more than the big one. Same in the life of a Christian. If we're not careful about maintaining our life, things will grow quickly and out of control. That's why they say it's a slow fade. It's one of those things that a little bit here and a little bit there, before you know it, it's bigger than what you thought it could ever be. And it's at the point now to where just a simple maintenance job is now turned into a whole life revitalization. So in the same life of a Christian, if you don't maintain your garden of life each and every day, things will soon grow that are not good, and they will stifle the things that are good. Same with everything we do. We have to check our lives. With that, let's pray. Father, we give you glory and honor for today. We thank you for what we're here to do, God. Ultimately, let us let our hearts bleed for what you died for. Let it, let it, let it just begin to turn within us for the lost. Let it turn within us for the things that we're not doing, but we can be doing. And God, allow this church to be a church that is not just the church in the church, but is the church outside of the four walls. Because at the end of the day, Father, you have not just told us to do something. You have commanded us as Christians to live a life pleasing to you, worthy of the call of a Christian. And Father, today I pray that you allow the hearts to be malleable, the, 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 the ground to be tender, so that when the seed is planted, even if... I don't get to water it today, God. And somebody else comes and waters it later. God, allow it to be there. Allow us to begin to look deep within our hearts and our minds this morning and begin to search our lives and our proverbial life garden and what it is that is there growing and what we're allowing to be there. With that being said, everybody said, amen. So you should know by now that I'm a contextual person. I love context and background. I believe when it comes to studying the Bible, it's like real estate. Real estate's all about location, location, location. Well, when you study the Bible, it's about con contextualization, contextualization, contextualization. It matters where you are in the Bible. It matters how you study it. It matters that you take something and you look at it and you expound on it before you try to do anything with it. Because oftentimes we will quote things that we think are meant for a season or a time and we'll be completely wrong and we end up doing more damage than we do good. That's maturity in a Christian to be able to look at the Word of God and say, there's something deeper to this, so take me deeper. To get out of how Paul says, and I'll mention this a few things today, a few times today, to get away from the milk and onto whole spiritual food, and that is in, indefinitely known as maturity. And maturity within the studying of the Bible comes when you begin to dive deeper, wondering why they did this, wondering why the culture was this way, wondering why of all the books that could have been put in the 66 books of the Bible, why was this one included? Why did they do what they did at this point in time? Why did, why did only these amount of letters to the Corinthian church get there, but there was two others that didn't make it in that we don't even know what, how they say? Why? When you begin to expound on these things, you will begin to ask questions that God is ready to reveal to you and take you deeper in the, into the context that we're doing. So with this this morning, that's the importance of context for me. And I know we got to get out of here, so you just going to have to follow with me this morning. But it was very difficult to find passages in the Bible about how to live. Not that it wasn't difficult to find them, it was difficult to narrow down what to use. Because when I begin to look, I begin to think back at all the things that I've studied. And I'm like, my God, I can, I can do all, all the books of the New Testament. And I could probably even do all the books of the Old Testament. Because all 66 books point to some way and somehow how to live. Whether it's by example of those before you or literal teaching of Jesus. 
I mean, the whole Gospels are full of the Pauline epistles, the Acts, the final epistles. And even Revelations holds truth beyond the end. It holds the truth of what worship really looks like as a believer. If you look deeper past trying to date set and when Jesus is coming back, you'll begin to get life lessons within the book of Revelations. So where do we pull from? Paul to Timothy and Titus, packed with how to be a good leader, how to be a good preacher, teacher, and even so much so to say how to be a good church member and how to be the church. How to live a life as a Christian. I mean, Paul and the other ten epistles and letters dealing with critical cultural issues of the time and where the church was located and all the different things that are going on in those churches. Peter, John, James, Philemon. I mean, Philemon. Have you ever thought about Philemon in the sense that it really doesn't have any biblical merit as in it doesn't have like just this is what you're supposed to do in quoting scriptures. In fact, Paul doesn't even quote any. But why does it include it? Because it says something about forgiveness. And Jesus' main thing was forgiveness. It teaches us even there. So we can even go to that small little book. But you get the point. So much in the Bible points directly to, in all 39 books of the Old Testament, point directly to how we're supposed to live. But we pick and choose what we want to fit the motive and the, and the mandate to where we are today. So it was not easy picking and choosing where the, to get our verses from this morning, but I believe I've got some good ones if you'll stick with me this morning. Um, we see Paul... He's, all, he's beginning his, yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, my gosh, Paul, think about it. Think about what this man has done, even continue to do before the disciples ever said, hey, you're one of us. He did it anyway. But we see his letters to Thessalonica Church in Galatia and Colossia, dealing with the very issues that we may be even dealing with today. But in Colossians is where I want to be pulling from. He is refuting false teaching, which is a theme throughout the whole Testament, the whole New Testament. Refuting, refuting false teaching. We find it in the Old Testament as well. He is dealing with cultural issues located where the church is. Cultural issues, much like the cultural issues we have today. If you ever look in a candid conversation with a really good friend of mine, reminded me very quickly that a lot of the issues we have within our churches is all cultural based. It's all how you were brought up. It's all how you see life around you because maybe it wasn't shown in the right lens of Christ. It's, most of it's cultural. The culture of today making us seem like we have to do certain things to be relevant within the church body. So he expounds and reveals the mystery of Jesus which shows us how to live. Through the sufficiency of Christ we're able to do all things. We're able to live according to how he tells us to live and commands us to live. It's not just a suggestion church, it's a command from Christ of how you are to live. It may have been penned by man, but it was given by the Holy Spirit to which it makes admonishing and teaching available. So we're going to look at this beautiful letter and Paul deals with, again, cultural issues, false teachers, exploiting different problems within the church. So this is what he tells the church. Colossians chapter 3. I promise it's not as long as you think it is. It's only 25 verses, but listen to the, listen to the truth. Be on the screen behind me. If then that you have been raised... With Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. At the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. It's already a mindset thing. It's how you're thinking, where you're at. From, for you have died in life, and, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also will appear with him in glory. Now, this is where the change is. Put to death. He doesn't say manage it. He doesn't say, just let it slide. He says, put to death. Therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, and understand passion in its place is okay. But when passion is out of the context of God's word and out of the context of how Jesus speaks to us, passion can be a very evil thing. So you've got to put passion in its place. Evil desires and covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put, on the, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have, been, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Sanctification. Here, there is no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Do you know the Bible also tells us to, uh, to go to one another and confess our sins, but we can't do that because we don't have unity. Because it's always about the dirt on the other person. Put then on. So we put to death. 
Now we're to put on these as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, is also known as unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Unity again. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns of spiritual songs, which could be corporate worship, with thankfulness in your hearts. And whatever you do, indeed, word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you realize everything in your life has the potential to be God-altering as far as altering your life and somebody else's? if you would just allow God to be seen in everything you do. That means everything, not the things that we pick and choose. That means everything in life. It's not perfection here, and I'll get to this quote later, but it's not perfection, and we'll get there. It's progression. Wives, submit. Now, you're probably wondering, why am I going into the family unit? Because if you've got an unhealthy family, you'll have an unhealthy church. So listen to me. Wives, submit to your husbands as it's fitting to the Lord. Husbands, do not get a big head about yourself because Paul later says, submit to one another as well because you're all equal and share with Christ. Moving on. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh to them. No, well, we like to do that because we think we can lord over the title, but Jesus says we're equal. Children, obey your parents and everything for it pleases the Lord. But also this, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. How many times do we pick at stuff that really doesn't need to be when our kids? Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service or people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. <clears throat> Fearing the Lord, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Have any of you realized that when you go to your job, you're still serving Christ? Or do you leave them at the front door? For the wrongdoer will be paid back the, for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Now understand, when Paul speaks, or even the Bible speaks about slavery, there are no way, in no form, shape, or fashion condoning slavery. A lot of bad men who call them, themselves men's, men of God have used a lot of the verses to try to say it's okay. But nowhere does he ever say it's okay. R slavery was a rampant thing within the Roman culture. I mean, they had millions. Paul was saying, no matter where you are in life, you are still to be a light for Christ. That's what he was saying. I wanted to make sure we clear that up. So these are the, this is some heavy-hitting stuff. I mean, it's 25 verses that would really take a lifetime to expound on and to live by. So all this will help us take care of the weeds in our lives this morning because if you're not careful, they will overrun your life. They will overrun and quench the things that need to be growing, the godly things that need to be growing. Overrun and keep you from being the Christian you're called to be and the world needs you to be among them. So let's get to our three points this morning. First is, uh, to start us out today, is preventing and maintenance. Prevention and maintenance, preventing and maintenance, however you want to say it. I know in my own experience I've said before that I can certainly say I hate weeding. Gosh, I hate weeding. In fact, I love the way the flower beds look, but I really don't want another one. I can do without another one. I'm good with what we got. Please don't add another one. But if my wife says so, you know, I guess I got to. In fact, I go through weed killer like crazy. And actually, it's kind of therapeutic. You know, you're like, die, die, die. You're finally going to die. So it's kind of therapeutic a little bit, but it seems like I go through it like crazy. Only to turn around, and it seems like that doesn't even kill it sometimes. Because when you think you've killed them good, they just come back. Even, the, even with the spray, you can't spray in different pla certain places of your flower bed. You can't spray close to the things you want to live. You can't spray close to the flowers in the, within the flower bed because you may kill them and kill things you don't want to. But this time, Tiffany said, I don't care if I kill it all, I'm killing the weeds. You know, weeds, if you don't pull them up from the root, they'll grow back within a couple of days. If you don't take care of the problem at its root in your life, it'll come back. All that sounds well like life. We want to spray it all, pluck up all the plants and just concrete it all. You know, that's low to no maintenance at all, right? It seems like no work. I mean, it sounds good, easy, and we don't have to put any effort in. But as Christians, you are meant to be the hope by your actions. To produce, which, uh, to produce hope, which means you cannot just clam up and not do anything. You cannot concrete over your proverbial life garden just because it's easy and you don't feel like maintaining it. Or even doing the things to prevent it. You see, if you don't maintain or prevent, weeds in your life will come back up. 
But we want this one time, it's over, we're good. But Paul says, die to self daily. In other words, it's an everyday thing that you have to allow things in your mind to conform to Christ. That you've got to lay down the old self and put on the new self because it's always going to be there. And if you're not maintaining and preventing, it will sprout back up again. It may take some time. In fact, much of the flower garden and, and garden itself, flower beds, if you're not maintaining it, if you're not pre- uh, preventing it again, it will just pop up one here, one there. I mean, you get the picture. So that Paul points to this. If you're writing stuff down or taking notes, it should be on the screen behind me, but be careful what you allow to grow in your life and what you allow to take root in said life. Let me say that again for those online. Again, thank you for being here. Sorry, I forgot about you, but say these for the people in the back as well. Be careful that we don't allow things to grow in our lives that don't need to be there. And be careful not to let certain things take root in residence that do not need to be there. And that goes from the Christian that is the youngest to the oldest. One little thing here and one little thing there may not seem like much, but like weeds, they multiply. Remember, what you feed lives and what you starve dies. When it comes to your life, there may be weeds that will need to be taken care of. And our main verse talks about a few of them. We're going to be hitting this verse pretty hard because I want it to be ingrained in your head this morning. I want you to remember these things. Remember to look for these things. Let's go back to Colossians 3, 5 through 9. The challenge here again. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, uh, <clears throat> uh, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account these, the wrath of God is coming. In this you once walked when you were living in them, but you now must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, <clears throat> which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there's no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, scathing, slave, or free, but Christ in all and all in Christ, or Christ in all and all in Christ. So you've got a pretty good vivid picture. You can't walk around and say, I don't know, or nobody's ever told me what this looks like, because not only does it say it here, but he says a lot of other things a lot of other places. Put to death, Paul says. Why? Because when it comes to living as a Christian, there's a newness of life. That comes with a renewal of salvation. There's a newness within you as a Christian that should be present. It should be visible. It should be tangible. You should be able to smell the presence of God. I know you may not feel them all the time. But my God, if we would just look for things within our lives that don't need to be there. That may be blocking Him from growing more in our lives. And us growing more in Him. How better would we be? How better would a community be? How better would the church be? But oftentimes, the weeds of sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry, starts to pop up. If we're not careful, the things will lead to more. Paul says further, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And he even goes on to say, don't lie to one another. Simply, just don't lie. These are the weeds that need to be prevented in our lives. These are the weeds that we need to be looking for. They don't need to be a normal part of your life. Now understand, Dr. David Cooper said it best. Christianity is not perfection, it's progression. In other words, you need to be progressing forward. You need to be moving forward. You need to understand that just because it's this way now doesn't mean you shouldn't keep moving forward and change it later. You can't use that I'm not perfect as an excuse anymore for what you're doing. You need to be progressing forward. You have to be progressively moving forward these things daily, maintaining the walk in the newness of Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, he says this, To put off your old self sounds familiar, which belongs to your former manner of life. Sounds even more familiar. If corrupt, thoughtful, and, uh, it, and it is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. It must have been pretty important for him to talk about it to two different churches. Must have been a problem at the other church too. In other words, hey, we all deal with it. There was churches within the time that were still dealing with the same issues and he was admonishing them and correcting them at the time. You have to check these daily at the door. You have to check them in your prayer life. You have to check them in your word because too often we walk around with anger and rotten language and impure motives and thoughts and desires. All these things that we play off like they're no big deal because you know others sin worse than I do and I'm not perfect and God can only judge me and we use all this stuff as an excuse for sin. 
But what it really is is weeds that we need to be plucking up from the roots. It's possible, but it takes some work. Because too often we will walk around with these things and still say, Hallelujah, God's with me, and not ever taking care of the problems. So we just hide it well. We'll, you know, the whole time those weeds are just continuing to grow. We put it on the facade and they're continuing to grow. We're putting on this face and they're continuing to grow. And the whole time, before you know it, your garden will prove who you really are by the fruits it produces. So what weeds are you allowing to, to grow in your life this morning? What, have you even thought to try to prevent them? Have you even thought to try to do something about them right now and take care of them? Because if you're not careful two weeks later, it may be even worse. Most people don't fade away that quickly. They slowly fade into darkness. And before they know it, where they're at looks totally different from where they were a couple of weeks ago. Fact number one is this. Prevention is self-examination. Crucifying the flesh daily. Thinking before we act. Praying before we make decisions. And allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us. Allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us. Fact number two is maintaining is abiding. Abiding in the Word, abiding in prayer, abiding in doing good, abiding in His presence, and abiding in worship daily. We all have weeds in our garden. Some are well hidden, but we all have some that we need to be doing something about. So we can be the Christian we need to be. Moreover that, the Christian that those around us need us to be. Sometimes you're the, and we say it all the time, but do we really take it with any kind of clout that you are literally sometimes the only Jesus people see? Do you know the magnitude of that? Have you stopped to ponder the magnitude of that saying, or has it become one that is just irreverently used now? Paul, in his first letter to the church of Corinth, dealing with cultural issues, amongst other things, just like we find in Colossae, saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Now, you've got to remember to put this in context of what he says earlier on in chapter 8, verse 9. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And just because you can doesn't mean it's even beneficial for you. And maybe not just beneficial for you, but it may not be beneficial for those around you. That is a problem today. And I promise I'm going to get to actually how to do this. I promise. But we as Christians, we become so selfish that we think that as long, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I do, but it does matter what you do if it can hinder someone else's walk that's watching you. That's the argument I have. Well, I don't really have anymore because I just allow it to be and allow God to do what he's going to do and allow him to be in the conversations. But that's why we give excuses for certain things. Well, I just do this, but it doesn't really bother me. But it may be bothering the person that they have a problem with it. And like Paul says, I won't do it if it causes my brother to be hindered. And that really means a lot of the things that we make excuses for. I even have to check it. Like, maybe I can do certain things, and and maybe it's lawful, and maybe it's not bad, and maybe it doesn't hinder me or make me a worse person or lead me down sin, but what if it leads somebody else? Then I'm in the wrong because I'm not looking for my brother. I'm not looking out for my sister. I'm not looking out for those around me because I'm too worried about me. But the idea I want to get to this morning is some weeds have a nice little flower, man. They look pretty, but they're still a weed. So this point, point two is some weeds are pretty. And let's be honest in here this morning. Sin wouldn't be so enticing if it didn't speak to something we wanted or we desired and know is not good for us. We wouldn't fall for some of the things if it wasn't something we struggled with. If it wasn't something that we know that's no good for us, but we still desire it. That's why you got to crucify yourself every day. you got to crucify the, uh, the self and the flesh every day. The writer of Hebrews in 12.1b says the sin, that sin, the sin that clings so closely. And in the NIV version it says that entangles us. That is because it's something that looks great. It's pretty and it may be even inviting. And it may be non-threatening. But if you're not careful and you let your guard down. If you're not weeding, if you're not maintaining, if you're not abiding, if you're not preventing. You will allow just a little bit in and a little bit of time and a little bit here and a little bit there. And before you know it, sin has consumed your life again. It's easy to do, church. You're not alone in how you struggle. We all struggle and we see that apparently there was other people that did for Paul to have to pin the things and the writer of Hebrews to have to pin the things that he does and the rest of the Bible that teaches us how to live. Apparently God knew what we needed. That is because it's something that looks great, pretty, and inviting 
and it may be non-threatening, but we allow it there. Let a little bit in. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit makes the whole lump rise. It only takes a smidge. What he's saying is it only takes a little bit. It only takes a little bit of this sin that you don't think is a big deal before you know it. It's, it's, it's in your life. It's consumed. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Not only does it take a little, it takes you ignoring. And not only does it take a little bit, but it only takes you ignoring it just one little time. Before you know it, your needs, excuse me, your weeds are out of control. Now remember Dr. Cooper's words when he says Christianity is not perfection but progression. But I want to add to that this morning. I want to add to that and say progression requires change and change requires work. Progression requires change and change requires work. You will have to do something on your own part. Making sure that what seems innocent at the time doesn't. It turn into a moral break? Does it turn into a moral, consuming, diabolical thing and something that will weaken your witness? Because after all, it's important how the people see you. We don't do it for people-pleasing ways, but we still need to be a light to the people. So it does matter what we do, how we act. Prayers need to start looking more like David's because we need to begin to re- require ourselves to examine ourselves, our minds, our motives, our thoughts, and our actions. And I can almost quote this one verbatim because I use it so much. And even in my own personal life, I remind myself, but you should know 1 Psalms 39, verses 24 through 25. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offense in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. He has to see the offense before he can get to everlasting. He has to examine. He has to maintain. He has to search for these things. And obviously, it's something that he needs God's help with because he can't do it on his own. So he says, God, I can't do this on my own, but you can. So show me, admonish me, teach me, grow me, mature me, and allow me to be able to live a life that will lead me into everlasting. You can't do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. You need the Holy Spirit's guidance. You need Christ in your life. You need people in your life. You need this in your life because that's the only way you're going to get to everlasting is to lean on the one who provided the everlasting destination. Because maybe what we have allowed to grow in our lives doesn't seem so bad at first. It looked pretty at first. It it smelled and felt good at first and it really didn't cause much harm at first. But as just like a little leaven leavens the whole entire lump, unchecked sin and passive prayer lives and unwillingness to examine oneself will lead to a life full of, gar- uh, full of weeds in your garden. Remember, what you feed grows and what you starve dies. So please, church, in your proverbial life garden this morning, pour life into your walk. Not just your feet in front of the other, but how you live Pour life into it. Pour life into your actions and your ministry. Yes, you have a ministry, even if it doesn't have a title within a church. It's called your family first. And if our family passes and goes to hell, what good were we even in other ministries if we couldn't even save the ones closest to us? Pour life into it. Pour life into the way you speak. Pour life into the way you live. And pour life into the way you love. And starve the weeds. Starve them. Do not allow the sin that so easily entangles and clings so closely snuff out and quench your ministry that God's building within you and that Jesus is trying to produce in you. Not just for you, not just for your family or your close friends, but everybody you come in contact with. Every opportunity could be a God opportunity. But we like to just put God in a box. Say, man, you can't work here. I don't have a degree I, I, don't, I don't really know what this says, but the Bible says the Holy Spirit will give you words when you don't know what to speak if you just abide in Him. But you can't do that if you're not starving the things that don't need to live and feeding the things that do. It's not perfection, church. It's progression. In other words, as Paul says, from spiritual milk to whole spiritual food, which is maturity. Some weeds are pretty, but after the first time you see them, but before you even know it, they're still a weed, and before you know it, they've taken over your garden just as fast as any other one. Now you just have a bunch of pretty-looking weeds that serve no purpose whatsoever. So examine yourself. What are the things that you need to pluck up from the roots? What are the things that have taken root and begin to suck the life out of the others? What are the things that are hindering your spiritual growth and your weakness? Jesus talks about the seed that was sowed and it falls on different types of ground. He says you've got to be careful not to fall in one place because it will stifle it and it will cause it not to grow because of how bad the thorns and thistles are. 
If it's the music you listen to, maybe it's the TV you watch, maybe it's the language you use, the things that you do behind closed doors that nobody knows about because it's an integrity issue. It's ex- maybe it's excuses or the lie of, I'm just too busy. We all have them from the youngest to the oldest. The older I get, the more I realize that the people that I thought had it all together are just as lost as I am sometimes. They just hide it better. And age doesn't stop sin from being an issue. There's old people that go to hell all the time, just as much as they're young. Sin is always going to be an issue if it's not dealt with. So what is it, young person? What, what are the small, pretty-looking weeds that you need to take care of that you're allowing to grow unchecked and you're just letting go rampant? What about you, adult? What are the little weeds that you're letting go unchecked? And be careful. Be careful before you start trying to do something with your children that you haven't checked your own life. Because maybe they're in the place they are now because you never checked yourself to begin with. I'm not trying to be harsh to you this morning. But a lot of the issues I have were cultured into me by my parents because of some things that they didn't want to take care of. But I, hey, look, I'm good with it. I'm fine. I've learned from it. I've grown from it. But at the end of the day, us as parents, if we live the life that we say we are supposed to live to our, children's, our children, if we preach and teach and live it, maybe, just maybe, some of the arguments will be subsiding. Maybe you'll be more toned down. Maybe you'll be more loving. And maybe you will allow God to guide you in discipline. Identify and acknowledge them in this is not a sign of weakness, y'all. Identifying and acknowledging your weaknesses doesn't mean you failed. It's a sign of maturity, really. The ability to examine yourself and even ask God to do it, which leads us to the ability to pluck things up from the weed because the, I mean from the from the roots is because we were able to ask God to do something we couldn't do. It's humility. It's maturity. To say, God, there's things in my life that don't need to be there. But I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried to do it myself. And every time I tried, I just plucked them up a little bit, but never grabbed the, the root because I can't do it on my, by myself. And I've realized that now everything that's out of control, that I'm not in control, but you are. They are they're no good for me, God. They hinder the relationship with me and you, and they also hinder the relationship to those around me that I witness to. So please, God, give me the strength, the will, and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do some weeding in my life so I can shine for Christ. It's maturity, church. It's humility. We all have to get there. We all have got to be able to say, God, I need your help. Because the day that we realize we cannot do it on our own will be the day that we start to see change. The day we'll start to see change. Church, that's humility, that's maturity, that's growth as a Christian. And the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews finished his statement like this. 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great, a great cloud of witnesses, let us not lay aside every let us lay aside, excuse me, every weight in sin that clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In other words, you've got to go to him, you've got to get to him, you've got to live in him, you've got to abide in him, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God for you and me. I added that last part in because that's really what it is. I'm not trying to be a heretical person here, but I'm, what I'm saying is the point of him being at the right hand of the Father is for you, to make intercession for you. And what a beautiful thing. But we can't run a race with endurance if we're constantly weighed down by sin. So we need to run our race with endurance, but we can't do that until we lean into the perfecter of our faith. It's about running the race that's set before you for a reason. You have a reason for living. You have a reason and you have a purpose for being who you are and created by God. It's amazing to me the amount of suicides that we have seen in the last year. It's amazing to see the things that are beginning to happen. All because of an identity issue of not knowing who we are in Christ. Which comes from not having a relationship with Him. Which probably comes from people not really living Christ out in front of them. It is so heart disheartening that someone who's created the image of God would feel that the only way to be better would to take their own life. That's a, I mean, you talk about the devil really hitting at the heart of Jesus. Man, perfect, perfectly created, 
He was, we were breathed. The Bible says in the very beginning that the first time we ever really see the Spirit, be like the Holy Spirit being mentioned, was when God breathed the Spirit into Adam. We're the only things on this earth that have a soul, according to the Bible. And God breathed a spirit into each of us. And it's time that we lean into it. It's time that we take stock of where we're at. I don't know about you, but it's time to do some weeding. I'm tired of being passive. I'm tired of seeing people just go to hell and we're okay with it. All because, as Christians, we're not examining who we are. And I'm standing here first and foremost, like Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. And if he can say that, who am I to say I'm not? But by dying to self daily, by saying to God, I need the Holy Spirit in my life to God and direct me because Jay can't do it on his own. Jay would have preached this message two or three years ago and it not would have made the difference that I believe it's going to make today. I would have not be where I am if it wasn't for him. I have to lean daily into Him. Because let me tell you, just because we grace stages in that we seem like we have it all together, I promise you I don't. I question every day sometimes, God, what is it that you want me to do? Are you sure this is what you want me to do? Are you sure this is where you want me to be? But if I wasn't leaning in, if I'm not abiding, if I'm not preventing, if I'm not maintaining, I would have quit three years ago. You wouldn't even heard this. Because life outside seems easier until we get out there and we realize that God's not in it. Let's move on. i got to hurry. So we've talked a lot about this morning to agree. Some of it was repetitious. I promise that I'm not trying to fill time or waste your time or that I've hit control, uh, copy and control V and just copied and pasted my whole message and just got into rampant and didn't really know where I was going. But as much as the Bible repeats certain things throughout the entire Bible so that we can be, so it can be ingrained into us so that we can reproduce it daily and that we can actually be the hope to those daily, I'm hoping through repetition, 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 that this will be ingrained in you, that this is how we are to live. With that being said, this, this, I'm hoping you'll reciprocate what you have been hearing, that you can live a life pleasing to God first and then to others. It's, it, I die to self so I can live in Christ and be a hope for others. I have to sometimes say no to me for the sake of someone else. I have to choose other people sometimes just like Christ chose me and came from heaven to die for me. Now understand this is not a, the, so the qu- last one we're going to look at and very quickly is what does a Christian life look like? Now understand this is not an exhaustive look because I could spend my whole career preaching this very point. What does a Christian life look like? And in fact, that's kind of the whole point of preaching in, in and of itself. So for the snapshot, we're going to go back and look at our main text, Col- uh, Colossians 3, 12-25. But now that you know all this maintaining stuff and all this stuff about this, let it soak in this morning. You've put to death these things. Now Paul says do this. Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Peter says we are a holy nation, royal priesthood. That's the church today. And later on, in, earlier on in Exodus, it was speaking to the people of God themselves as Israel. So we're, look, we're chosen. We're chosen. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing one one another. And, in all, and as, if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you so that you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, so in which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms of hymns and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts for God. And whoever you, uh, whatever you do, do it in, uh, in word or deed, do it in everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now let's look at our family. We need to be modeling that so that our family can look like this. With Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh to them. Children, obey your parents and everything for it. It pleases the Lord. Father, do, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey everything, the, everything that those who are your earthly masters, by, not by means of eye service or people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord above all is what I'm thinking there. I'm thinking like he's saying to me, I've got to fear God above all before I could ever do any of this. Whatever you do, work 
work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, keep uh, knowing that for the Lord, uh, uh, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. An inheritance that doesn't stop it. It doesn't fade away. Moth and vermin do not destroy this inheritance. You are serving the Lord Christ for you receive this inheritance. Now moving on, the wrongdoer we paid for the wrong that he has done and you know, there's ju- and be justly acted upon. Sometimes we just got to sit back and let God do the justi- justi- uh, justifying the things or maybe even God vindicating things because just like David, sometimes you don't need to kill Saul. You need to allow God to move them out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, handling conflict correctly, the love of God, unity, peace, thankfulness, teaching, correcting, wisdom, worship, praise, corporate worship. Do all this as it for God's godly speech, obedience, submission, training up your children in hardworking attitudes and so on. I mean, wow. What a blueprint. What something to gauge. It's an acid test to gauge the Christian life. This is jam-packed with the portrait of godly living as a child of God. And that is translated into your work life, your home life, your personal life, and your children and your marriage. These are the earmarks of a Christian. These are the fruits that begin to manifest within the Christian life. These are the things that must be in our lives, not just when it's easy and convenient, but in every day, each day, waking up and putting on these things. You may have to practice one a lot, but you better be progressing forward a little bit. You may not get them all right. I'm still learning patience to this day, but I hope I'm making progression. And if I'm not, I'm asking God to show me where it needs to be, what needs to be worked on. Do you know that many issues could be resolved if we would just handle conflict correctly with other fellow believers? If that through unity and love that we could just do what Matthew 18 says, be humble and then go to your brother to which you have a fault with, and handle it in love instead of taking it out of the context of God and putting passion into it into other places like social media just because it keeps you from having to talk to the person front face to face. It's unity. When we have the unified thing, it's okay to have conflict because the conflict's within the realm of Christianity, it's within the realm of Jesus, and that conflict can actually produce growth if we do these things. Do you know how many issues that could be resolved with that? Instead of doing the things that we do. Think about this. How many, how many things in life would be different if we just sowed humility instead of pride? Compassion and kindness and love instead of drawing conclusions that are unfounded and nowhere near God's heart. If we gave without asking, God didn't ask you to do a background check on every person. He just said give. Give and let him handle the rest. Now I understand there's, there's spiritual discernment there. And I understand that you don't always need to give what somebody wants in certain situations. You need to give what they need, and that may be tough love. So don't get me wrong there. Don't twist it. If we had unity, I mean, man, if we had unity. If we unified as a church beyond race, politics, denominations, and we actually were the church, and we were unified, unified as the body of Christ, man, we would change the world. If we allow godly wisdom to govern our decisions, our actions, and our speeches, how we talk to one another, how we communicate with the outside world, if God was in it, amazing things could happen. If we held close to the teaching and preaching, even when it's admonishing and correcting, if we submitted, if we obeyed, if we worked hard at everything, because that shows God in us too. True, unadulterated Christian living is possible even in the world today. We are not the first to deal with an immoral culture, a godless culture, and a culture that's quick to say what is wrong is right. It may be a lot more rampant, but we're not the first. What do you think the cultural issues were that Paul dealt with? It was all about how to live. He had to teach them how to have relation within a marriage because all they known was bad. He had to teach them simple things. Why? Why? Because the church today can deal with it and be just as successful as the church in the past. We have the Holy Spirit after all. We have the Bible after all. Many didn't have this during that time. All they had was certain letters. We're more equipped than we've ever been. And if the church then could stand up and stand out and stand firm in the calling of God, this church can too. Because it has to start with each individual person saying, I'm going to stand up for the Word of God. And I'm going to live according to that Word. And to stand out in the world and be a light on top of a hill and not hide it. 
and to stand firm in the calling of God when things happen in our lives that we don't understand. That's what Paul was saying and prayed for in the start of the, uh, the letter that we were in in Colossia, to the church of Colossia. He starts with this, this prayer, almost kind of like a benediction. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased praying for you. How many people are you praying for? How many enemies are you praying for? How many loved ones are you praying for? How many people are you actually taking time to pray and call out their name to God? Asking that you may be filled with knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good word and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom you have redemption and forgiveness of sin. To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. In other words, to live in a manner worthy of the call of God that is placed on your life and pleasing to Him. And He repeats itself in Philippians 2. And He says the, almost the exact thing verbatim to that church. To live a life in manner to which is worthy of God, worthy of your calling as a Christian. And it's fully pleasing to Him. It's possible, church. It's possible. It's possible, child of God. But it all starts with a little weeding in your garden of life. 